it's a great pleasure to, to visit Princeton and to give these lectures here. So before I ask you whether there is some question about the previous lecture, let, let me briefly review what we have achieved, what we have done. So the idea was we started wondering about thinking about the simplest object and the most natural object to consider when we study some physical theory, namely the S matrix, in particular when we study some quantum field theory. And when we have an S matrix, we have translation and time invariance, so uh, time, time and space translation invariance. And this was discharged, which I called Q1 and Q2. And we wondered what happens if we have more, more nonlinear charges depending on the momenta when n is bigger than 2. And we saw, because we want more symmetry, more symmetry normally means nicer features of our theory. And we saw that if we are in more than one plus one dimension, well, the S matrix simply becomes too trivial. It becomes just, we just get the free, free theories. However, we can get very rich and very interesting theories if we stick to one plus one dimensions. And in one plus one dimension, what these extra charges implied, as we saw, was that by acting with these charges, we could translate the particles by an amount which depended on their momenta. But because all the scattering is in a plane, there is no way they go away far enough, and they eventually they need to scatter. And therefore, what it tells us is that scattering factorizes. And three-body scattering happens in a factorized way as a sequence of two-body scattering events. And of course, we could act with this charge in different ways. And in this way, we saw that the order on which the particle scattering is not important. And this is what was called the Young-Baxter relation, which, as I told you, and as we will see today, can be very constrained uh, can be very constraining when we try to find the S matrix of some quantum field theory. What to do once we find the S matrix? First of all, if we find the S matrix, as we said, we solved the, theory, the problem in uh, infinite volume. This is what we want. We want to pick particles, scatter, and receive them in some detector. But, well, sometimes it's very useful to put the theory in finite volume. First, because in ADS CFT, as we saw, there is this very interesting mapping between operators in our gauge theory and spin chain states. And there, we don't want to consider some huge spin chain states. So there are many circumstances where we want to consider finite systems. So this is a very good example. I want to be able to study operators where I have a few scalars. I don't want to consider operators with one million scalars, right? Who cares? So sometimes I will want to go to some finite volume where my space is finite. And even forgetting about n equals 4 and any of these fancy things, let me remind you that often, when we want to sum over the states in any theory, in a field theory or whatever, it's very useful to put the theory in finite volume to know what's the measure and to get some good density of states. And then you take L to infinity. And it doesn't matter if you put it in periodic boundary conditions or open boundary conditions. But still, it's important to put it in finite volume to know how to sum states. So we, it, it's quite useful to, to learn how to put your theory in some finite volume. So let's put it in some finite large volume. And then what we saw was that the spectrum of this set of integrable theories are given by a sum of the energies of each of the particles. Of course, it makes sense. And what do we need to do to find the energy of a single particle? We need to study the single particle case. So this is what's called the dispersion relation. Where do, and how do I find this moment of my excitations? I solve what are called the beta equations, with, whose physical meaning is I pick one particle j, I scatter it throughout all other particles, and the total phase acquired, which is the free propagation plus the several factorized interactions, must be equal to 1, and this quantizes me the momenta. Right? In, a free part, in a free case, I would not have S matrices, and p would be 2 pi n over l. OK, so this is the solution. In principle, what you need to do is study one particle, study two particles, and in principle, you are done provided, of course, L is large. And if L is not large, maybe I will have time today or tonight to explain what should we do. Now, of course, this arises in many interesting circumstances. In particular, and very excitingly, it arises when studying four-dimensional gauge theories, which seems somehow, uh, which is really remarkable. But it arises in a funny way, in a smart way. We need to be smart in order to find how to use techniques of integrable models in four-dimensional gauge theories. And the idea is to think of our single trace operators, our fundamental objects in our gauge theory, as being spin chain states, which is just a translation of notation. And then the mixing matrix, the dilatation operator of n equals to 4, can be thought of as a spin chain Hamiltonian, whose range increases with perturbation theory because of the planar limits. 
And it turns out that, perturbatively, this Hamiltonian is integrable. OK? And why was it, is, was, is it integrable? Because as we saw, we constructed explicitly many conserved charges. Let me remind what was the logic. Why do, the, uh, do there exist many conserved charges? Because there is an operator which depends on a spectral parameter which is arbitrary, which commutes with our Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian is also constructed from this operator by taking some log derivative at some particular value. And what is this operator? It's graphical, it was like this. It was a trace of a product of R matrices over some auxiliary space. And this product was called the monodromy matrix, which was L of U, and the building blocks was the R matrix. And this relation here, saying that T commuted with another T, and in particular with H, followed because the R matrix obeys the Young-Baxter, and this is our first uh, requirement. We start with some R matrix which obeys Young-Baxter, and we carry out this procedure. And Young-Baxter fixes the form of the R matrix. For example, for SOM, you can have something proportional to the identity, to the permutation, and to the trace. And then when you impose, when you impose Young-Baxter, you fix the relative coefficient. So it's proportional to this. Of course, the overall you don't fix, but you fix the relative coefficient. And from there, you can see what Hamiltonian follows following this construction. And you see that the Hamiltonian, which follows from this construction for SO6, is the Hamiltonian of the SO6 sector of n equals 4. And the reason from perturbative computations about why do we get the correct coefficients be, be, behind the several terms in the Hamiltonian came because of the structure of the interaction with this commutator square. OK? And therefore, this implies that n equals 4, at least in this scalar sector, is integrable. And as I told you, this extends to more. So what is the, the, what should we take home from this? So it seems like in this four-dimensional gauge theories, if we are smart enough, we can identify one plus one dimensional structures. Right? It's the usual idea that in the planar limit, gauge theories are somehow string theories, right? So, so the idea is that the, the key idea, the key step, is if you want to compute some quantity, to try to think of it as a one plus one dimensional quantity. In principle, some quantities might be very simple to, to understand what could be the trick. In this case, it was particularly simple. We knew that single trace operator correspond to single strings, so a single trace operator was already a string, and it was not a very, a very hard step, say, to do. But in general, in principle, if we want to consider other object, objects in n equals 4, like scattering amplitudes, correlation functions, etc., the key idea would be let's try to identify a way of thinking about these objects, these quantities, in a, a most one plus one dimensional way possible. And then, probably, we will find some integrability structures because the integrability which is behind all this, as we will explain, can, for example, be explained from an integrability of the world sheet of the string theory, which n equals 4 is dual to. And all these different processes, like scattering amplitudes, correlation functions, et cetera, they are basically made out of the same world sheet with some different topology. So, so one plus one, uh, so n equals four super young mill has a relatively simple one plus one dimensional description if we are smart enough. And if we find it, then we can use techniques of integrability to solve for the quantity we want in principle at any coupling, which is of course very exciting. So questions about what we have seen so far. Otherwise, I will move to the other side of the correspondence, and I will move now to the, to the strong coupling, and let's understand where are these charges, where are these QNs from the string theory point of view? How to construct these charges if I start from the string sigma model? No question? Yes. Yes. Um, what if you're scattering objects like strings that are extended? Do you think there's some generalization that you're really If they are extended, but they, if they still have some typical size, then I would not say how to, I would not see how to avoid this. What you could imagine, what you could be more worried about is in conformal theories, where indeed, even if you separate them a lot, right, the interaction is like one over R. So they are never really very separated apart and uh, where this argument might fail. 
So, but indeed, in conformal theories, we don't have an S matrix anyway. We have to regulate it and to define somehow in a regulated way. And when you regulate, we introduce either some mess or some cutoff or something which puts us back probably in this kind of setup. Yes? Uh, when you calculate S matrix, you use Yapak star race. Yeah, so of course, don't confuse the S matrix which I'm describing here, which is one plus one dimensional S matrix, with the four dimensional S matrix of n equals four or something. Yeah. Uh, to compute the four dimensional S matrix of n equals four, we would have to be smart and to find some integrability techniques to use this one plus one dimensional S matrix. And there, are, there is some progress recent, but. So you can, what you can do concerning this one plus one dimensional S matrix is you can fix the matrix structure, which is what is relevant for young Baxter, purely from symmetry, right? This is what Juan described in his lectures. How just using the two slash two residual symmetry, how can you find the S matrix? And then you can explicitly plug in Mathematica and check, indeed, it obeys young Baxter. But you did not use young Baxter to prove it, but it, luckily it comes out which gives us some hope that the theory is integrable at any loop order. Because we don't have any freedom. It's not like we are using Young-Baxter to fix the S matrix. We just used symmetry, and then we were lucky and it obeyed Young-Baxter, which is something necessary for the theory to be integrable, but it's not sufficient because you can have some two-body S matrix which obeys Young-Baxter, but the three-body S matrix doesn't need to factorize into products of two-body S matrices. But it's necessary. So it's good. It's a good indication. It's almost sufficient. Right. Good. Okay. So now let's move to to strings. Let's try to see where are these charges and how do we see uh, Qn from, um, from the classical string point of view. How do we see that this, the world sheet theory has all these funny conserved charges? So let me start a bit more general than what we need and consider some general um, one plus one dimensional quantum field theory. So we have some tau and some sigma. We have some world sheets. And let me consider theories, and I will show you that strings in spheres or in ADS fit into this uh, setup. Let's consider that we have some theory uh, where we have some group element G, which depend on sigma and tau. We have some current J of sigma and tau, which is just the current constructed from this group element, just G minus one DG. Current. Of course, by definition, this current is flat because it's G minus one DG, right? So of course, DJ plus J where J equal to zero, right? I mean, in the usual non-abelian gauge theory language, this would be the statement that this J would be A and this A would be just pure gauge. Let me use letters which you might be more used to. It would be just omega minus one D omega. And F in this case would be zero, right? Of course, this is nothing but this. Okay, so let's consider some theories where there is some group element. We can define some current. This current is flat by definition. The non-trivial step, the non-trivial ingredient which I want to, to require is that the equations of motion for this theory, which we will show, which again I will show that, for example, strings in spheres fit into this family, the equations of motion are nothing but the conservation of this current. Okay? So suppose we have this. We have some current. This current is conserved. This is the same as equations of motion. This current is flat. This is what you normally would call Bianchi identities or flatness condition. And we have these two conditions here. One of them 
it's a triviality. The other one is equivalent to equations of motion. OK? Any question about this notation? Does someone want me to write this in components or anything? Is it clear? OK, if no one complains, I will not. So then the statement, let's make a claim. The statement is that there exists a flat connection, which I will call A a view. And you see that I'm using the same letter, and I will call this U the same name. This U I will call its spectral parameter. It's a complex number. And this connection is just j minus or plus u times dual of j over u squared minus 1. Right? In components, I have something like a sigma equals j sigma plus u j tau over u squared minus 1, etc. Right? The claim is that I can define such current, and this current is flat on the equations of motion. And the claim is that on the equations of motion, d a plus a wedge a is equal to 0 for any u. And this is what's important, for any complex number u which was arbitrary. It's very simple to show this. The only thing you need to do is to write this to see that this is equal to Bianchi plus u times equations of motion over u squared minus 1. And therefore, of course, if this is equal to 0 for any u, both Bianchi and the equations of motion need to be 0. So this condition, it's a nice way of packing Bianchi plus equations of motion in a single equation. OK? Now, then we can do the following thing with this flat connection. When we have a flat connection, loops Wilson loops made out of a flat connection are independent of the path of the loop, right? Because the deformations of this loop are proportional to the field strength of this flat connection, which, as we said, is zero. So then it means that we can consider some path order exponential of this flat connection, A of u, in some contour gamma. And the contours gamma that I have in mind, for example, if I have infinite volume, I can have some gamma like this. This will be an infinite volume. If I have a circle L, then I have in mind a loop which winds, which winds this cylinder once. This is what we would have for a closed string. And then the statement is that if I define this, and notice that I'm using exactly the same letters as L of u, as a monodromy matrix, then the eigenvalues of L of u, um, let's call this tau, are tau independent. That is, I can put the loop here, or I can put the loop here, and I get exactly the same result for the eigenvalues. I can say also that trace of the path order exponential of the integral of A of u, which I would call T of u, the transfer matrix, is tau independent. It doesn't depend on where I put this loop. Right? Is this clear for everyone? Because basically L, which is the Wilson loop, evolves by conjugation, right? So when I take the trace, the omega and omega minus 1 are basically irrelevant, and I obtain that the trace is invariant. And the eigenvalues are invariant because the matrix evolves by conjugation when I change the endpoints. Good? So, but this is really remarkable because then we have some quantity which we can put at several different times of the string and which does not depend on time. But what is this? It's a conserved charge, right? <laughs> this is the definition of a conserved charge. So then it means that t of u, for example, by expanding 
in some power series, something like Qn u to the n defines infinitely many Qn's. And therefore, these theories, they have all this tower of conserved charges. Any question here? Yes. Sorry? Again. Ah, no. A priori, no. No. A priori, a priori the Hamiltonian does not. OK, so l l let me. OK, yeah, answering your question. So let's try to. So we have the spin chain, and now we have the string. OK, now I realize that what I'm going to write is a bunch of equal columns. I'm going to write u here and u here, which is not really very instructive. But so the spectral parameter is exactly the same. Just one second. The path order exponential, right? What you do, the path order exponential, is you are breaking the path, your exponential into small pieces. And each small piece is the analog of this R, which we were multiplying to make the transfer matrix. Then this full object, which was L, is the analog of this L, which was the product of all these Rs. And here, this path order exponential around this loop, the transfer matrix T, is the analog of the T, which is the trace of this L operator. OK, so of course, there is a, a close relation. And in some models, it is indeed possible to think of some quantum field theories as the continuum limit of some spin chains. And for some models, it is indeed possible to discretize this relation and quantize the theory by some quantization of this kind of T operators and A operators. It's not the case for nonlinear sigma models because it's not, the Poisson brackets are not ultra local. But for some theories, it's possible to quantize them by discretizing similar equations and by mapping this map precise and by thinking really of the field theory as a continuum limit of a spin chain for some theories, like St. Gordon, for example. OK, so before it becomes too abstract, let's see some examples of theories which. So this is a statement about classical integrability. And the idea is that we hope that these charges pre persist at the quantum level. So basically, in a second, I will show you that strings in spheres fit into this uh, family. So what I have shown by this is that if we believe ADS-CFT is that we have integrability at weak coupling in the SO6 sector of the theory. And we have integrability at strong coupling when we describe strings in S5. And then, of course, we believe that integrability will be preserved in between. But this is a statement about classical integrability. Notice that I am assuming that this, this is only flat on the equations of motion, right? What do you mean by that? I don't know if you look, look this. In which vector space is L of u? So L of u, so this A, you recall this G is a matrix, right? G is a group element, so J is a current. For example, if you are in SU2, G is an SU2 group element, a two by two matrix. J is G minus one DG, is again uh, in the uh, two by two, a two by two matrix, and this, there are two eigenvalues. Of course, you could then take your group element in the other representations, and you would get more eigen, you get transfer matrices in other representations. Right? But G is a group element, it's a matrix. Okay, to make, uh, let me emphasize, so for example, the most obvious example is what is called the principal chiral field. It's the simplest possible example. You want to write some action, which is some integral, and you want to use G. You want some kinetic term. And you want to have some symmetry under left multiplication and right multiplication. So the simplest thing you can do is to just do this. And then you have some, some symmetry of G under left and right multiplication. And this, for example, fits perfectly into this example of models. Indeed, the equations of motion are nothing but d of g minus 1 dg equal to 0, as you can check easily. So this is an example. And what is g? g belongs to some, some group. For example, g can belong to SU2, 
right? In which case, this L of U is a two by two matrix. Okay? This is an example. Now let's, let's have a look at something a bit more interesting. What kind of one plus one dimensional field theory describes strings in spheres or in hyperboloids to describe S5 and ADS5? Questions? No, no one knows how to discretize, how to quantize the sigma model in such way. So no one knows how to, in principle you could ask, can you discretize the, the sigma model and in this way find a spin chain? No, you don't, you, no one knows how to do it. You cannot do You cannot find a spin chain which is integrable such that the continuum limit of it is the matzai of cycling string. It's an unsolved problem. But I believe it, it should be possible. Okay. So second example, strings uh, in spheres or in hyperboloids. Okay, so how do we describe strings in, in spheres? Well, we have some vector n, which depends on sigma and tau, the world sheet, and n is a vector such that n squared is equal to 1. And what is n squared? n squared is we have the first component square, the second component square. This square is equal to 1. This would be what you would get for a sphere, let's see, uh, d minus 1, right? This would get to get for a d minus 1 dimensional sphere. And for example, this could be n1 square plus n2 square minus minus n2 square. This is what you would want to describe anti the sitter space, for example. When I write n squared equal to 1, I can be using both signatures. What's the Lagrangian for such, for such theory? Well, how do we describe such a vector which lives in the sphere? So we have a kinetic term dn, dn, and then n squared is equal to 1. So we can do it by we put some Lagrange multiplier, and we impose the constraint that n squared is equal to 1. Okay? What are the equations of motion? Let's now see what are the equations of motion and understand that indeed this looks different from what you are probably used to and it doesn't look at all like a weakly interacting field theory. So the equations of motion, what I vary with respect to n, d square n plus lambda n equal to zero, right? These are the equations of motion. What is lambda? How do I find lambda? How do I find lambda? No one tells me? Yeah. <laughs> I want this one more. Okay, so we multiply by n. So we dot this with n, and we find that lambda, because n squared is 1, lambda is minus n dot d to n. I don't like this very much, because I don't like to have a second derivative in my differential equation here. So what can I do? I can write that this is dn square. Is this clear why? No? Sorry? Yeah, because n square is equal to 1, right? So of course, this is just because n square is equal to 1, and this implies that n dot dn is equal to 0, and now I take one more derivative, I get this. And then I get, therefore, that dn d square n 
plus dn square n equal to 0. These are my equations of motion. OK? And let me, let me remind you that this is very different from something more conventional. Uh, this is very different from something like when you have some free boson, dn squared, plus eventually some mass times n, plus some coupling, and then you could have something like n squared n, and this would be some mass, and this would be some weak coupling, and you would expand, and you would have some free particle, and then some interaction. So this is very different from it. This is really intrinsically very strongly coupled. There is this curvature. It's not something that you would look at it and say, OK, this is how you quantize. It's tough. This one is tough. OK? So this is what the model is. And now you might wonder, why does this fit into this category that I told you? And this I leave as an exercise. And the exercise is the following. If I define my group element, G, which is a matrix, it has two components. And let me define this to be eta AB. This is delta AB, if we are speaking of, spheres, of spheres, minus twice NA and B. Then uh, the construction follows. That is, equations of motion are indeed conservation of the current which follows from this G. So you have this G, you construct the flat connect, the current, and you check that the equations of motion are indeed given by this. Another comment, which is somehow usual, which is somehow important, is that for the SU2 principal chiral field is the same as the O4 sigma model. O4 sigma model is this model where d is equal to 4. And indeed, you can easily see this is another exercise. This is 1, and something else that you can do is that indeed, if you write the group element of SU2 as n1 plus in2, n1 minus in2 minus n3 plus in4, n3 plus in4, OK, up to some sign in this one. I, mean, I don't remember. If you write this, 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 no, it's correct. So if you write this, which belongs to SU2, why does it belong to SU2? Because n square is 1, and the determinant is nothing but n square. Then indeed, the action of the principal chiral field turns into the action of the SO4, which is OK, SU2. SO4, we know it's SU2 times SU2. And SU2 is the, the group manifold of SU2 is the sphere, the three sphere. And I want to introduce this model because uh, strings in ADS5 cross S5 are similar in a way to these principal chiral fields where this element G would be an element of PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4. There is the group would be this 2 comma 2 slash 4. The model is not exactly a principal chiral field. It's what is called a Cosset model, which is somehow a bit more complicated. But conceptually, it's good to think that it's, it's not very different from a, a principal chiral field model. OK? So we see that principal Carroll field models, these models where we have some group element, and this kind of nonlinear sigma models for strings in spheres are tightly related and uh, both appear in the context of ADS CFT. Any question here? No? OK. So, so basically, this tells us that we should expect that this. ON models or OD models, these are what are called the OD sigma model, should be are integrable, they seem. There are these charges, at least at the classical level, and we might expect also at the quantum level, we might be able to completely solve them and to, to find their exactest matrix and to completely solve this kind of models. And then we can try to use this experience to solve the sigma model which appears in the real superstring uh, theory in ADS5 times S5, where we put all the fermions and all the extra complications. But this is like a warm-up, a toy model for ADS-CFT. OK. Yes? 
No, it's not conformal, yeah. Right, so it's just a toy model. Absolutely. Very good point. So the ON sigma model is not conformal. Particles, they have some mess. What are particles in the ON sigma model? I mean, I look at the sigma model, I have this complicated, this not so trivial Lagrangian. I have some nonlinear, very nonlinear model. What are particles? I mean, they should transform under some SOD representation, but which representation? What are the particles which arise in my theory? So to answer this question, it's very useful to consider S the SOD sigma model with D very large. Because when D is very large, it turns out that we can solve this model exactly, get some intuition about what is the particle content, how are particles, and then move to finite D again. So let's go to very large D, and let's consider the partition function of the model. So we integrate over these vectors n. At each point, we have the Lagrange multiplier, which we integrate over e to the integral d, uh, dn square plus lambda n square minus 1. Now I'm going to do a typical textbook computation. I'm sorry for those who already know this by heart. Let me integrate over the field n. What does the integral, the Gaussian integration over n gives? Gives just a determinant, right? For n, the action is quadratic. So when I integrate over n, I just get e to the minus integral. Let me put a coupling here, 1 over g square. e to the minus integral. This lambda here gives me lambda over g square. I don't touch it, this last constant here. And what does the integration over n give me? It gives me trace of d square plus lambda. Right, it gives me a determinant, which is log of trace, which is e to the log of trace. Uh, sorry, trace, sorry. trace of log with one half. What am I missing here? Just to see if everyone is following. What am I missing? I just, I just, I have a square root of a determinant. I put it upstairs. Sorry. No. What am I missing? Just doing a Gaussian integral. I have my vector n. I did a Gaussian integral. I, I put it in the exponent, one half of this trace. Sorry? We have d components. For each component, we do a Gaussian integration. So there is a d here. Multiplying this. Very important D. Because now, because this D is very large, we can do a saddle point computation. Right? So crucial that we have this many components, and therefore we can use large N techniques. OK, good. So we have the D there. And now we can do a saddle point to find what is the value of lambda. The action for lambda is some huge prefactor. It's classical. And we can find what is lambda. So d large implies that I can do a saddle point for lambda and find in this way that 1 over g square, right? I'm just taking the derivative with respect to lambda, is equal to the integral d to p over the 2 pi square. I'm just computing this traced log. Uh, uh, 1 over p square plus lambda, uh, n is d. Right? And this integral is divergent. I should put some cutoff here to renormalize. And what I deduce is that my expectation value for my lambda is given by some cutoff e to the minus 1 over g square n. There are some factors here. I'm not paying a lot of attention. This is what is known as dynamical mass transmutation or generation. Dynamical mass generation. Generation. We start with some coupling G and we end up with some expectation value, which I'm going to call M square. Why does this make sense to call this expectation value M square? Sorry? Sorry? 
Absolutely. In other words, because what this does is it tells you that lambda will have roughly this vacuum expectation value, right? So when you plug it back into the Lagrangian, what this expectation value for lambda does, it makes this Lagrangian into just dn square plus m square n square. And so this m here becomes generated. And now we see what we get. Now by looking at here, we see so particles are, they have some mass m, and they have some color A, which runs from 1 to D. They are vector particles. They are D components. So particles are vectors with D colors. They have some mass M. They are relativistic. So the energy of a particle, I can parameterize it as M cos of theta and P as M sin of theta. This is a way of parameterizing so that E square is equal to M square plus P square. And this theta is what is called the rapidity. And this is basically what I want to take home. Particles, they are relativistic. They have some mass m, which is dynamically generated. So as you said, it's not a conformal theory. They have some color index, which runs from 1 to d. And, and now I believe that qualitatively the same picture is true if d is 7 or 3 or 4. And, uh, and this is my particle content. Good. So we did the first step in solving an integrable model. We found what are the particles. We found what is the dispersion relation of my particles. We found what is energy as function of their momenta. What's the next step? The S matrix, right? Now we want to study two particles and ask ourselves, what is the S matrix for these two particles? when I have some theta 1, some theta 2, some color A, some color B. So what is this S matrix, which depends on theta 1, theta 2, and which has some index A, B, and some final indices C and D? Right? So. Can someone tell me, some, uh, how would you start going about finding this S matrix? What would be the starting point? First, can we learn something about how does it depend on theta 1 and theta 2? I'm saying that I put a coma there, but is it really a coma? Is it really an independent function of, of theta 1 and theta 2? How do boosts act? Sorry, oh, someone spoke. But so, so, mm -hmm. right. So boosts, Lorentz boosts, are nothing but shifts in theta, right? So it means that this S matrix, we already know something about it. It's really a function of one variable theta, A, B, C, D, where this theta is the difference of rapidities, right? This is just Lorentz invariance. Good. So we already did something. What else can we try? Now the theory is not any theory. It's not just a theory with SO4 symmetry. It's a very particular theory. It's an integrable theory. So what should the S matrix obey? young Baxter. So the S matrix must obey young Baxter. But we solved this already. The solution is in the corner there. We already solved what kind of objects. We call them our matrix, but who cares? It's the same. The equation is the same. It's exactly the same equation, right? It was exactly the same picture. So we solved already. The solution is here. We just need to put m equals to 4. OK, great. So we already conclude that this S matrix, it's almost done. It's just some function, which we don't know, times theta times the identity minus the permutation plus 2 theta over theta minus i. I'm just putting m equals to 4 here times the trace operator. Just because of Young-Baxter, as we saw. We're almost done. One function only missing. To find this function, we need to use what's called crossing symmetry. But I want to emphasize how remarkable it is. So we just have the OSO4. We assume just a bit of symmetry, Young-Baxter, 
And just because we have young bugs, we already did most of the job. There's only one function to fix. OK? So now, as Juan explained, to fix this overall factor, which is normally called the dressing factor, we need some extra input. We need, for example, crossing symmetry and unitarity and so on. Let me use some nice argument, which I believe is due to Beiser, to argue about what the equation for crossing is. I believe the crossing equation for the sine Gordon model was presented, but it was not really derived, so let me try. To s what kind of equation, how could we derive an equation for this g of theta? So this is somehow, I mean, it depends how mathematical you are, but I think it's rigorous enough. So let's consider this crossing, crossing symmetry, right? Crossing symmetry is something related to looking at processes in one channel, other channel, and imposing consistency. And let's think of it in this way. Let's create some unphysical state. Let's call it a singlet state. And this is an unphysical state. with zero energy, zero charges in general, but zero energy and momenta in particular. And color. It's really a singlet. It's really something that it's really nothing. And if you scatter any state with this boring object, which will have no charge, no energy, no nothing, you should get the same as no scattering at all. So what, how could we build this object? Let me write you the result. I could construct it as a two-particle state by summing over the four possible colors. This is to make it colorless. And then I have one particle with color H and rapidity theta, and another particle with color H and rapidity theta minus I, pi. OK, if you allow me. Let me, OK, it's OK. OK? Now, indeed, what happens is that this particle here, you have some epsilon of theta and some p of theta. And you can easily see that if you re replace theta by theta minus i, what this particle has is precisely minus energy of theta and minus p of theta. And indeed, the charges are precisely reversed. And you have some state with total zero energy and momentum. And now, what we do is we impose that if you have this state, which is somehow created here with some theta and some theta minus i, and if you have some particle going through this state, this should be the same as not going through it at all. If you look at it from the cross channel, it looks like unitarity. You have two crossings, and you can just disentangle the crossings and, net, and get no scattering at all. Let me put some indices here. I'll put some j, m, m prime, j prime, h, h. Just if, in case you want to reproduce it at home calmly, let me tell you in terms of an equation what would this picture mean. This picture would translate into the following, a sum from h equal to 1 up to 4 times the sum k equal to 1 up to 4, S matrix of theta with components j, h, k, m. OK, k is the index which is flowing here. In between, it's the color of this intermediate particle. And you can see that this makes sense. Times the S matrix theta minus i pi with indices k, h, j prime, m prime should be equal to delta j, j prime, delta m, m prime. And you can easily see that this picture matches, uh, that equation, this equation matches that picture there. But now that we have this equation, this is an equation which gives a product of S matrix is equal to the identity, we can plug the S matrix that we found and find an equation on G, right? I mean, it should be clear for everyone that this gives an equation for G. But if it's not clear for someone, please tell it now. 
right? I'm just, I have an S matrix, I plug it there, and I get G times G equal to something. What this equation implies is if I define G of theta to be equal to, I'm just using a more conventional notation, sigma square times I over theta minus I, then this implies the equation that sigma of theta plus I pi over 2 times sigma of theta minus I pi over 2 is equal to theta minus I pi over 2 over theta plus I pi over 2. Cool. <laughs> so we are almost done. We have one equation to solve, and we completely find the S matrix of a very strongly interacting field theory, something that would be otherwise impossible to do in half an hour, right? So how do we, find, how do we solve such equation? Can someone propose something? Some non-integrability expert propose something? There are many ways, of course, but can someone propose one way of solving such functional equations? No? So for example, a simple way is to take the log of the equation and the derivative with respect to theta. This is just to simplify, then we integrate back. Then we get that the derivative with respect to theta log of sigma plus plus derivative with respect to theta log of sigma minus. It's clear what sigma minus and plus is, right? It's just, it shifts by plus and minus i pi over 2. It's equal to, let me take, OK. Sorry. Uh, if I move, uh, I multiply by 1 over 2 pi i. This is equal to 1 over pi. It's really hard because I, I normally don't work with this pi, and now I'm trying to put it. Uh, it's, it should be something like this. Yeah. Yeah, good. So this is the kind of equation we would get. And now you see, now it's quite simple. Now what we can do, let me, I will go as if there was no subtlety, and then we will try to discuss the subtlety, but now let me. Let me fool you and just go to Fourier. What's the Fourier transform of a function of theta plus something? It's just an exponential times the Fourier transform of the function, right? So when I go to Fourier, I get that the Fourier transform, let me define k of theta to be 1 over 2 pi i derivative of log of sigma of theta. So I get the Fourier transform of k times e to the i omega pi over 2 from this factor here, plus e to the minus i omega pi over 2. Ah, sorry, the I, uh, translation is by i, so there is no i here. e to the minus omega pi over 2 Fourier transform of k is equal to the Fourier transform of a Lorentzian, which of course is e to the minus absolute value of omega pi over 2. Someone said anything? Some, someone said something? OK. And therefore, here it is. I find the Fourier transform. F of k, which is just e to the minus absolute value of omega pi over 2 over 2 cos omega pi over 2. I compute the inverse Fourier transform, and I integrate. OK? So here is the final result, sigma. And now I need to to keep, OK, Whew, this will be tough with the pi's. Let's see, sigma is gamma of theta over 2 pi i, gamma 1 half plus theta over 2 pi i over the complex conjugate. Now let me fix the signs. <laughs> Almost correct. Minus plus. OK? So this is the result. You integrate back, then you get that sigma is given by this ratio of four gamma functions. So you see that 
we didn't use the Lagrangian at all. Just some very minor assumptions, just to see what the particle content is. And then there we went, integrability fixed almost the S matrix. Then we found an equation for crossing. We solved it. We found such complicated S matrix, and we claim we solved the O4 sigma model. This is the solution. This is the full S matrix. Now, if you want the spectrum, plug it into bit equations and compute the spectrum of the model in, finite, in large volume. Now, let me mention it first. There are an obvious question. Since we almost didn't know, use the Lagrangian, how, how do we know that we solve the right theory and not some other theory with SO4 symmetry? This is a big question, right? We want to, to solve the O4 model. I mean, what kind of checks? How do we know that we solve this theory? We didn't use the Lagrangian at all. We, have, we just said we have some dynamical mass transmutation. Here is the S matrix as function of theta. How do we know this is the O4 sigma model and not some other integrable theory with SO4 symmetry? Right? So this is the first question. And the second question, let me just mention this technical detail. When I went to Fourier, you might complain that this, mm, there must be something wrong because I can always add an anti-periodic function of sigma here, and I, don't, and I can also get an inhomogeneous solution, something I multiply sigma by some tangent or something which is anti-periodic under this shift, and I get the same equation. This is what is called a minimal solution. It's the solution with the smallest amount of singularities in the theta plane. And indeed, when we shifted the contour, when we are Fourier transforming this function of theta plus i pi, and then I said, it is just an exponential. When you do this step, what you do is you are integrating over some contour at i pi over 2, and you bring down this contour, and you just keep an exponential factor. But when you do it, you assume that there are no poles, no singularities here. So there is physics here. You are imposing that the S matrix has no bound states. So you are imposing that your particle content, that there are no other bound states or resonances or anything in your spectrum, right? So this seemingly innocent step contains lots of physics about the possible singularity structures of my S matrix. And what we have done by just naively Fourier transforming is finding the simplest solution, the solution with the smallest number of singularities. How do we know that this is the O4 model? So what did people do? What kind of checks are done? So first, it's possible, now that we have the full quantum bit equations, to take some sort of classical limit and show that somehow we reproduce the, the classical description of the O4 model. This is possible. But it doesn't probe a lot. There are many things in the bit equations that it doesn't probe. It's not yet completely consistent. So something nice that people did was, again, they, what they did is they go from d equal to 4 to general d, and they repeat the same steps, and they find some S matrix for general D. And then they do a large D expansion, and they compare with perturbation theory. And they check that up to a couple of loops it works. So the idea, one idea to check that indeed we solve the right theory is to go from SO4 to solve instead the SOD sigma model, and then compare the large D expansion with perturbation theory. So what we do, what we can do in half an hour will take, of course, many weeks to do from the Lagrangian, but eventually it should match. And these people did successfully. They also did Monte Carlo techniques. They did lots of things, and it works. Yes? I'm sorry? If there are all these particles... If there are negative norm particles? Theta. Yes, the rapidity, yeah. Ah, no, sorry, okay. No, theta can be, uh, can be whatever you want. Theta can be positive and negative, and the energy is m cos theta, it's positive. The moment is m sin theta, it can be positive or negative. For these gamma functions, you mean? Ah, okay, the, the poles of the gamma functions are not in what's called a physical strip. So there is a strip of theta, which is enough to cover all Mendel's time invariants. So there is a region in the complex plane 
which is enough for you to cover all kinematic invariants that you can construct, S, T, U. And what you impose is that inside this fundamental strip, which covers the full kinematics, you have no poles. Outside, you don't care what happens. Sorry, yeah. Good question. Yes? This is completely quantum. This is the full quantum solution of the O4 model. Yeah. No, I did not. No, I assume. So if you want, forget about Lagrangians. That's very old fashioned. You just say, I have some theory, and the theory has O4 symmetry. My particles transform into our vectors in O4 representation. The theory is integrable. Here is the solution. Ah, who cares about some Lagrangian, which, right? Now, this kind of derivation of the crossing equation is the most useful one for, um, for ADS-CFT. So let's just keep in mind, what would we do for ADS-CFT? So, so what do we have already? Let's call this equation some, some symbol like this. What's the name of this symbol? Cardinal? Uh, OK, we have partial. A. So in ADS CFT, we have A. Right? This is what Juan explained. And it was done by Bizart. So using symmetry, we fix the S matrix up to some factor, right? This you saw how to do in the lecture. You use symmetry, and you fix the form of this S matrix. Here, symmetry is not enough, notice. Symmetry here is obviously not enough, because we only know that it's a function of theta 1 minus theta 2. And then any function here, any function here, and any function here with respect SO4 symmetry. We are using the SO4 invariant tensors, right? So symmetry here would not be enough. But in ADS-CFT, it is. You don't even need Young-Baxter. If you use Young-Baxter, you can check that it obeys Young-Baxter. So we have the analog of this. We don't know the dressing factor. Or you don't know the dressing factor. People know already the dressing factor. But how would we find the dressing factor? Again, what we would do is we would construct this unphysical state, one. What would be the requirement? It should be a singlet. It should have no charge, and it should, um, it should have uh, no color, no nothing. So what you will do is you try to build a two-particle state, and then you act on this particle state with all the generators of your theory and find the coefficients of the state so that it is indeed such an physical state with zero everything. Right? This was done by Bizart. So you construct one by imposing that Q on this state is equal to zero. OK? And then you impose that the crossing with this non-trivial, with this trivial state is equal to not, the scattering with this unphysical state is equal to not crossing at all. And you find an equation for, for sigma. And this gives me an equation for sigma. And, in this, and you solve this equation, which is really not completely trivial. And... Um, and this gives you the full solution to the spectrum of a four-dimensional gauge theory if you trust the SCFT. Well, not exactly the full solution. Why? Because knowing the S matrix, it's almost perfect. It tells you what the solution is if the volume of the circle is very large. So what I have explained in principle is the solution to the problem of the spectrum problem, the solution to the problem of computing the spectrum of single trace operators in n equals 4 super young mills for long single trace operators. OK? So if we repeat what we have done in the lectures and compute sigma, then let's summarize. So what we could do is the anomalous dimension of n equals 4 super young mills in the SU2 sector, say, where you don't have to worry about matrix and you just have some z's some X fields, and they have some momenta P and some momenta P prime, would be equal to a sum of a dispersion relation that Juan explained 
where e to the i pjl is equal or times the product of k not equal to j of this S matrix that we find by crossing of p j comma p k is equal to one. And this is valid if L is large, which means that this is valid if you are from the point of view of, if you are at weak coupling, plus terms which are of order g to the 2L, where L is the length of my spin chain. So if you are at length 1,000, this gives you the full solution to the spectrum of operators up to 1,000 loops in perturbation theory. At strong coupling, these exponential corrections should be thought as virtual particles going around, and uh, the way we control the, their suppression is like, rather it as e to the minus m times l. So we can now plug this into a computer and solve. But this only works um, for large l. We might want for example, some small operators like trace, zx, zx. The anomalous dimension of this operator, what is this? And to compute this, we need to go even further in our analysis. So what we have showed, what we have seen is how to compute anomalous dimensions of our spectrum of integrable theories in very large volume. And now, a, big, a very important question is, what if the volume is small? What if it's very small? I mean, somehow the claim is, you have the S matrix, you have everything. But then you, you can ask me, so okay, so what is the spectrum of a theory in a small volume, right? So you give me the S matrix, I should be able to give you the spectrum in a very small volume. This is not easy, right? This is, this is tricky. And I think I will leave this for the, for the night session if someone is interested, but uh, of course this is a very important challenge, and in n equals four, it has been to a great extent solved. So we start with infinite volume. We compute the S matrix. This is great for L large. And now you ask how to get the energy at finite volume L. Okay, thank you. Questions? Sorry? The quantum? Yeah. So the S matrix, we can find the full S matrix of n equals 4 super n mills. We can write down an analog expression with like this gamma functions. We can write it down what is the exact dressing factor for ADS CFT. There's no assumption. We can do it at any lambda. We can write an expression which gives you what is this dressing factor at any uh, toothed coupling. It's really an unperturbative result because, I mean, nothing, as you saw, all this matrix structure, all this analog of this expression A, which is, okay, it's already not here, the analog of this expression where you have the matrix elements of the S matrix, you can find the matrix element as function of the coupling, right? For any coupling, you can find the matrix structure. So when you find crossing equation, you get something like S matrix times S matrix equal to a known function of the kinematics and the coupling. And you solve it. So you solve it for any kinematics and any coupling, right? I can give you a flavor if you want. Okay, since I finished a couple of minutes earlier, let me write down just for curiosity for those who are curious. What, how does the dressing factor look like? How does the S matrix look like? So we saw in the 4 it's a bunch of gamma functions, four gamma functions. Let me see if I can do it. So the sigma factor in ADS-CFT, first it's useful to write it in terms of U, where U, do you remember what U is? Juan introduced probably this Tchaikovsky variable, no? No? Okay, so let X of U be a function u plus square root of u square minus 4g square. You see the coupling enters here over 2g. 
This is just definition of x of u. Then, a nice way of parameterizing the energy, this formula, I'm sure Juan wrote, right? This dispersion, right? So we introduced before in the relativistic model a variable theta to solve explicitly the dispersion and to write explicitly some energy and momentum which obey the dispersion uh, parametrically, right? Which uh, parameter which. So we can do the same and introduce this u. And then the energy is 2ig over x of u plus i over 2 minus 2ig over x of u minus i over 2. And the momenta is 1 over i log of x of u plus i over 2 over x of u minus i over 2. And as an exercise, you can check that this is true. So you just, if this is the energy and momenta, indeed, it's equivalent, absolutely equivalent to this expression here. Now, in terms of this u, which turns out to be very useful, the S matrix takes the following form. It's given by four functions, x of x of u plus i over 2, x of u prime plus i over 2. Let me call this chi plus plus because of this 2 plus here. And then the other function is plus chi minus minus, minus chi plus minus, minus chi minus plus. Okay. This is a useful way of writing it. And then this chi is also, also looks a bit like some gamma functions, even though it's a bit different. And then this chi as function of x and y is given by an integral representation where you integrate this z1 over the unit circle over x minus z1. You integrate dz2 over the unit circle, y minus z2, log of gamma 1 plus ig minus z2 minus 1 over z2. OK? So this is it. So this is the full S matrix of, um, of um, of ads -CFT. Actually, there is something else. There is a trivial part here. So there is a trivial part and then a not so trivial part, which is given by some integral representation. You can put now these equations, this S matrix, into bit equations for the periodicity of the particles, compute the energy at any loop order, and, um, and in this way get the the full asymptotic spectrum of a four-dimensional gauge theory. Yeah, the, 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 the other part I put there, this is 1 over i times this log. Yeah, this is the full S matrix in the SU2 sector. Yes? No, it just means that I can repeat the same kind of analysis that I did and construct this infinite tower of conserved charges. No, but that's there, the zeros are already. Yeah, but these are not the zero charges. Yeah. These charges are really local and they are like the energy, the momentum, and then you expand. There is this notion of locality, like in a spin chain, where you have this energy, then a big, longer range. They are, they are somehow different charges. It's a very interesting question. What is exactly the relation between the conformal Symmetry and integrability. Because in, in, indeed, I mean, models which are conformal also have these towers of conserved charges, right? So, and there are indeed some people, in particular Bajanov, Lukianov, and Zamologikov, who try to explore these connections between can we somehow view conformal models as particular cases of this more general family of integrable models like O4, etc. It's a very interesting subject, yeah. And another way we can see that it's integrable. So as, as we said in the beginning, how do you see if a theory is integrable? Either you construct it, and you know you are constructing something integrable, and we saw how to do it today for sigma models and yesterday for spin chains, or you check. And how do you check? You pick three particles, you scatter, and you see if the scattering factorizes. And people computed up to two loops from the string world sheet, and they check that it, it factorizes. 
So not only we have some evidence because we have classical charges, we have also some evidence because it, it, the one loop correction to these charges was computed and shown using PRST and pure spinner not to, to vanish. To not to be uh, broken quantum mechanically, but also we even have an explicit check up to one loop that uh, indeed it factorizes. No, no, just, okay, so just to sort of extend my question a little bit. Uh -huh. In conformal theories, you would just have correlation functions in theory. Sorry? Matrices. Absolutely, yeah. Here, if you want, what I, all these lectures were about two point functions in this, uh, in n equals four. So, in principle, just the verse or uh, if you know the primaries, all n point functions are in. Not exactly different. It's bootstrap equations, which is not trivial. I mean, okay, so in practice, it's tough. Notice that here we have not done as much as to compute correlation functions. I mean, we just computed the spectrum, which is simpler than. I'm not. I did not compute for you correlation functions in the O4 model. That's that's trickier. I computed the full spectrum of the O4 model, which is already good for one hour. But um, but to compute the full form factors, et cetera, would be tougher. I, that, that people do it. And Spinov does it, for example. More questions? Okay, thank you. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Uh, nice lectures. Oh, thank you. Um, so, one question. From the gauge theory side, the competition that we do, is, uh, I mean, um, as uh, one did it, the SU22 dynamic is matrix is determined using the symmetry algorithms yeah. and the dispersion relation is determined. So the check of ADS you have to use in the quantum signal model would be now, I mean, there you use the same dispersion relation as derived from uh, each. Huh? The symmetry is exactly the same. Exactly. Even the extended part can understand that some gauge may not be everything. So the only, so the only check would be find the two body S matrix and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. And in the short operating case, uh, once we match this two body, I mean, in the, okay, as far as the matching is concerned, is it automatically matched for uh, thermodynamic Bethan circuit as well? Because we have already matched, I mean, afterwards the competition is same. You compact it. From gauge and from string? Yeah. From gauge here you have no solid argument to justify the two body. What does it mean to, to change time and space? I mean, space, time, uh, space and time, they are completely different. I don't know of a good argument to justify the weak rotation from gauge theory. So at that point, everything is very uniform. Everything I did, I, it, or everything Juan did, rather, it's gauge or string, who cares? It's the mm. same. When it comes to weak rotation, this is the point where weak rotation is it's trickier to understand from the, from the gauge theory. That's something which I like about this argument. This argument almost, you can almost argue that it should work in the gauge theory, right? You, you create something unphysical, completely zero, and the scattering uh, with this something completely zero should be zero, right? Should be 